Kane Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times podcast, recorded at Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Q and Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at qnreview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. The Glasgow Times on Thursday, the 9th of November, 2023. From the news section, an exclusive article. Do more to stop youngsters falling into a life of crime, says Pastor. This article was written by Amanda Keenan and is being read by me, Corey. A reformed drug addict who was once held at gunpoint has called for more support to help people into further education and transform their lives. Stuart Patterson, who escaped a life of gang violence and crime to found a flourishing community church in Easterhouse, says that more needs to be done across the city to help those sliding into a life of crime. The 53-year-old has spoken out after completing his second degree on Friday, a Master's in Digital Journalism from Strathclyde University, a far cry from his days blighted by drink and drugs. Stewart says without the help offered to him, he would have ended up dead on the streets. He said, It is okay saying that people need to have a desire to better themselves. But some people are just dealt a bad hand in life, and before they know it, their life has slipped into a maelstrom of despair. I feel that more needs to be done to reach these young men and women, to offer them a chance to build something, to give them a purpose. We need better support networks, more access to education, and more companies willing to give people a chance. Firms like Timson's are great examples of those who are keen to try and help those going through rehabilitation, but we need more of them. We previously reported that the dad of three knows what it is like to be at his lowest ebb. He went from being offered a scholarship at prestigious Glasgow school Hutchinson's Grammar to dropping out of education at 15 and sliding into a life gripped by drink and drugs. He admits picking up his second parchment last week was a moment he often thought he would never see. Stuart added, I'm proof that anyone can turn themselves around, if they are given an opportunity. I never imagined I'd be accepted into university, let alone graduate with distinction and then earn a second degree. I don't think of myself as an example to others. But if people can look at the hurdles I've overcome and believe they can too, I'm buoyed by that. It's never too late and the past doesn't have to define anyone's future. As a teenager, summers for Stuart involved fighting on the streets, smoking cannabis and drinking cheap tonic wine as he tried to fit in. He left school as soon as he could and got a job as a butcher. Soon he was taking drugs before eventually finding himself in prison. On his release, the Paisley man found a new role on a building site, and a love of heroin that resulted in a gang holding a gun to his back and threatening to pull the trigger. The moment that almost cost him his life proved to be a wake-up call, and Stuart, who was then 27, knew something had to give. He explained... If I hadn't gone to rehab when I did, it's pretty simple. I would be dead now. I have no doubt of that. I was given a scholarship to a private school but started smoking cannabis and before long I was tempted by harder and harder drugs. The gangs I would hang around with became like family to me. 
and I became stuck in a spiral of addiction. But I needed help to quit. Stuart says he was fortunate that his mum persuaded him to talk to a local clergyman. Sadly, they have written take to a local clergyman in the article. And he was able to offer him the inspiration to turn things around. But believes not enough people are able to open a similar door. He said that's what needs to change. There needs to be more ways of getting to people when they are still able to be saved and while they still want to save themselves. The only thing I cared about was getting £10 to score drugs and I know there are so many other young men and women who feel the same. If we can just open more avenues to them at an earlier stage, I know we can turn so many lives around. Personally, I found God and started to think about how I could help others rather than myself, and I've never stopped. Stuart says graduating last week has given him the perfect boost as he approaches one of the busiest times of the year for his church. He added, People think Easter House has a terrible reputation for crime, but it's one of the best places around. Only this week I was going round the doors with another guy from the church handing out Advent calendars and seeing which homes might need a little help or support in the weeks ahead. What struck me was the amount of people offering help back to us. Easter House has its problems, but it has real heart. That article was from the Glasgow Times, and it was an exclusive article written by Amanda Keenan and read by me, Corey. The Glasgow Times on Thursday the 9th of November 2023. From the news section. An exclusive. Wife's tribute to Glasgow Hospice after loss of childhood sweetheart. This article was written by Anne Forthingham and read by me, Corey. Strutting across the dance floor, a vision in sparkling black, Peter Gould knew how to light up a room. The company director and keen actor, singer and musician was a huge supporter of the Prince and Princess of Wales hospice, including a willing participant in its glitzy, strictly style fundraiser. He really enjoyed that, says his wife Dawn with a laugh. He loved taking part. Peter and I and our group of friends would always support the hospice, on nights out, at different events. She pauses. We never ever thought we would one day be walking in here needing the help it provides. It made us look at everything through different eyes. Peter died in October, three and a half years after being diagnosed with bowel cancer at the age of 47. Donations at his funeral totaled almost £14,000, which the hospice say is an unprecedented amount for such a collection. Even some of the younger kids who come along to the local group we are a part of, Studio 32, gave us money. And that means so much, says Don, who lives in Thornton Hall, on the outskirts of East Kilbride. It just showed how much Peter meant to them what a difference he made in their lives. Now Dawn and her daughters, Emily, 23, and Ailey, 21, are preparing to support the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice Light Up a Life ceremony on December 10th. The Gows will join many families who have lost loved ones at the special service, and the Glasgow Times will publish the names of all who have donated later this month. It was musical theatre which brought Don and Peter together. We were kids when we met, childhood sweethearts, says Don, who is a fitness instructor. We were both in an EK rep panto in our hometown of East Kilbride. I was 16. Peter's illness came completely out of the blue, says Don. He hadn't been feeling 100%, nothing specific but he was finding it hard to go to the toilet, she adds. He got it checked out and the doctors told them there was a blockage and it was serious. 
Things happened quickly after that, recalls Don, as bowel cancer was confirmed and Peter had surgery and chemotherapy. He recovered, but earlier this year, his health began to deteriorate. Tess confirmed the cancer had spread to his liver. He was so positive, though, always, says Don. We were both supposed to be performing in Sunshine on Leith in September with our local group, Studio 32, and we just kept thinking it was going to happen. She pauses. Although, I think in my heart, I knew that he was getting sicker. Eventually, Peter was too ill to stay at home. Moving to the hospice was like a weight lifting, says Don. Everyone was so fantastic with him, with all of us. Nothing was too much trouble, she says. It was such a relief knowing he was getting the care he deserved. The care everyone deserves in that situation. After just a few short days in the hospice, Peter sadly died. Don and her daughters are determined to continue fundraising for the place which supported them through their darkest times. We are going to keep going, nods Don. She pauses. Some days it is hard to do that, she admits, her voice breaking. But life goes on, and we have to live the best we can. For more information on Light Up Life, visit Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice, all one word, dot co dot uk. That's P R I N C E A N D P R I N C E S S O F W A L E S H O S P I C E. That article was from the Glasgow Times. It was written by Anne Fotheringham. It was written by Anne Fotheringham and it was read by me, Cory. This is from the Glasgow Times on Thursday the 9th of November 2023 from the Lifestyle section. Carlton Community Centre in Glasgow separates 10th birthday. This article is written by Morgan Carmichael. A Glasgow community centre celebrated one of its greatest successes last week. The Calton Heritage and Learning Centre, CHLC, based in the east end of the city, marked its 10th birthday with a party on November the 3rd. Featuring a performance from the drama outfit What's Her Face, founded by River City star Maureen Carey, an audience of 80 were treated to music and comedy sketches in the CHLC, featuring references to local characters. At the event, the new communities who run the building had Chief Executive Gary Naylor and the new chair, Pauline Casey, cut a 10th birthday cake. Gary said the effort by the community to create the Calton Heritage and Learning Centre cannot be understated. It was people power which made this place a reality and we owe every one of them a huge debt of gratitude. It now plays a vital role in the vibrant life of Carlton and in the East End in general. Long may it continue to serve this great community. Long-serving original manager Rosie Robertson added, It hardly seems like ten years since we first opened our doors. We cannot now imagine Calton without the CHLC and over the years it has brought people together in so many ways. The centre on London Road opened its doors on November 1st 2013 after years of campaigning to deliver a much needed Calton community hub. Since opening, the centre has become a success ever since, acting as the main host of local activities. The date of the opening of the centre in 2013 was chosen specially as it marked the 124th anniversary of the collapse of the Templeton Carpet Factory. In 1889, during construction of a new extension to Templeton and Company's nearby carpet factory, unusually high winds caused a section of the facade to collapse onto an adjoining weaving shed. 
Sadly, there were workers in the shed at the time, and 29 women lost their lives. The names of those who died in the tragedy are inscribed on the paving outside the CHLC. That article was written by Morgan Carmichael. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 10th of November, News MOD police officer cleared of sex attack on women article by Connor Gordon An MOD police officer has been cleared of sexually assaulting a woman after a night out. Derek Park, 34, was accused of groping and physically assaulting the 22-year-old at his Airbnb flat in Glasgow City Centre on November 21st, 2021. The woman claimed she was touched intimately by Park. She went on to say that the former Marine also grabbed her by the neck and pinned her to the couch. Park, of Aberdeen, was alleged to have covered the woman's mouth, which she said felt like being drowned. The woman further stated that Park also tried to undo her trousers. Park went on trial at Glasgow Sheriff Court, accused of sexually assaulting the woman to her injury and danger of life. He told jurors that that laid down beside the woman on a couch, kissed and touched her for various areas of her body with consent. Park also stated that they did not put his hands down her trousers. Park told the court that he was suspended by the MOD after he was spoken to by police and had to sell his home. The charge against him was found not proven by the, by the jury. The court heard that the woman became separated from her friends during a night out. She stated she met strangers Park, his male friend and two other women named Carla and Amber at a karaoke bar and spent the night there with them. The woman claimed she went back to Park's Airbnb in order to charge her phone to get a taxi of her own. She stated that Park did not have a charger to fit her phone, so they waited on him charging his own. The woman claimed Park's friend went to bed while she and Park chatted and joked with each other. She said Park complimented her looks despite being told that she had a boyfriend. The woman claimed Park tried to kiss her and grabbed her neck forcefully at the front. She said, He then tried to pin me down and put two hands over nose and mouth. He did the other hand off my nose and tried to touch me up. Prosecutor Darren Harty asked how he tried to touch her up. She replied, In between my legs. The woman stated she could not breathe and it felt like drowning. The woman went on to claim Park grabbed her by the breast and pinched her over her clothing. She stated Park also tried to unbutton her trousers but she managed to get his hand away. The woman said that she told Park to stop and he allegedly replied, Sorry, I'm not sorry, I can't help it. The woman was later able to phone a taxi through Park's phone and was picked up at around 8am. She stated that she attended a police station with her mother later that day and also went to hospital. Laura Ann Radcliffe, defending, suggested that her client touched her in various areas of her body with consent, which she denied. She put it to the woman that she felt instant regret and that's why she was upset, which the witness also refuted. Miss Radcliffe said, I have to say you fabricated this whole story for your own benefit. The woman replied, no. Park told the jury in his evidence that he was a Marine for six years but had been a Ministry of Defence police officer since May 2021. He said that they laid down on the couch with each other and kissed at the property. Park stated he touched her upper body and gave her a love bite on the neck. He added that the contact between them lasted for hours. Miss Radcliffe asked him if she told him to stop, which he replied, no. Park said he was informed of police interest in him while, work, while at work in Helensborough. He told jurors he was suspended after the allegations came to light. Park said, I had to sell my house. Me and my daughter had to move in with my parents and I had to give up my dog. Every day for the last two years is all I can think about. And that report was by Connor Gordon. From the Glasgow Times... Friday the 10th of November, from the news section. Murder bed thug caught by police stabbing his victim. Article by court reporter Grant McCabe. A murder bed thug who was caught by police stabbing his victim is behind bars. 
William Neal attacked Gary Henderson as apparent revenge for early assaulting the 50-year-old's partner. The 30-year-old had to have the 6-inch blade removed from a wound at his armpit. He also needed treatment for a collapsed lung at hospital. Neil, on Friday, pleaded guilty to attempted murders at the High Court in Glasgow. He is due to be sentenced next month. The hearing was told how Neil's partner, Joanne Dunchy, had gone to a house in Cumbernauld, North Lanarkshire, hoping to get the keys to the, her home of her late mother. Prosecutor Greg Farrow said her nephew was there with his friend Henderson. On asking to speak to her relative, Henderson told her to F... Asterix, 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 off. Mr. Farrell said he pushed her with both hands, causing her to stumble. On regaining her balance, Henderson punched and slapped her to the face. The court heard Nielsen learned what had happened. Miss Dunchy was described as highly distressed at the time as police were called. Henderson was later walking to a car when he was confronted by Neil. Mr. Farrell said Neil was seen in possession of a knife. Officers arrived and saw him stab Henderson. On being told to drop the knife, Neil complied and was handcuffed. The prosecutor said Neil was subject to a community payback order at the time for an earlier offence involving a weapon. He also had previous convictions for violence. Neil's lawyer, Alan McLeod, told the court, the only thing I would like to make clear about this offence is that the plea was tendered on the basis of wicked recklessness. There was no intention to kill Gary Henderson. Lord Jung remanded Neil in custody as sentencing was deferred for reports. And that article was by court reporter Grant McCabe. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 10th of November, from the news section... Murder trial jury watch Gary Moore being shot on doorstep. Article by court reporter Connor Gordon. A jury of a murder trial watched CCTV footage on Friday of a gym owner being shot on his own doorstep. Gary Moore was killed at the property in Airdrie, North Lancashire, on September the 6th, 2018. Barry Harvey, 34, is on trial at the High Court in Glasgow accused of murdering Mr Moore. Court papers state Harvey acted with Thomas Guthrie, 27, who is joined in the dock, as well as a man named Neil Anderson, to induce Mr Moore to leave his home. The charge says they repeatedly discharged a firearm at him. Harvey, while acting with Guthrie, are also claimed to have set fire to the vehicle used in the alleged crime near a farm in Mulgai, Eastern Bartonshire, in an attempt to pervert the course of justice on the same day. The court heard from Detective Constable Susan Fairley, 37, who created a CCTV log taken from footage gathered after the attack. DC Fairley stated that Mr Moore had CCTV situated at his property and this was shown to the jury. A man identified as Neil Anderson was said to have come out of a thrifty van and chapped Mr Moore's front door. He was seen to be holding a bag of chips and was joined outside the property by Mr Moore. The officer stated that Mr Moore then engaged with a dog in a passing BMW before he returned to speak to Neil Anderson. Prosecutor Lorraine Glancy asked if the footage showed, showed a white Skoda Fabia turning round on the street and drove back towards Mr Moore's home. DC Fairley replied, yes. She added that the Skoda's lights were on and off before it moved on. DC Fairley said, Mr Moore turned around and looked in the direction of the vehicle. He appeared to flinch. He puts his hands in, in the air as if to protect himself. The person is seen running in the direction of Mr Moore. The person is seen to be wearing a hoodie top and blue latex gloves and is in possession of a handgun pointing in the direction of Mr Moore. A secondary view of the incident was also shown with a person exiting the rear passenger side door of the Skoda. The officer said that the person had his hand over his face. She later stated that Neil Anderson was seen to move away from Mr Moore when the gun was pointed at him. CCTV from July 2018 onwards were also shown to the jury. Neil Anderson, his brother David Anderson and Mr Moore were seen to speak outside his home on a number of occasions. 
DC Fairley described one meeting in July, which she said showed Mr. Moore with his hands on his head and kneeling down. She stated that Mr. Moore looked animated and not relaxed. In a meeting with the Andersons on August 31st, the officer said Mr. Moore looked fidgety moving around while the brothers were more relaxed. Harvey and Guthrie faced a separate charge of attempting to murder Joseph Shields on July 19, 2018 in Glasgow's Lauriston by striking him in the head and body with a knife. The pair and Darren Owen, 23, faced a separate murder bid charge on Scott Bennett by discharging a firearm and shooting his head at a car park at a Vets in Rutherland, Lanarkshire on December 3, 2018. Owen and Thomas Wilson, 26, are alleged to have murdered Raphael Lico on February 11, 2019 in Cambus Lang in Blantyre, Lanarkshire, on February 2019. The charge states this was done by causing him to enter a vehicle and discharge a firearm at him. At him. Harvey is further accused of assaulting Guthrie by striking him in the head with a bottle and the body with a hammer to his injury. The trial continues before Judge Lord Clark. And that report was by Connor Gordon. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 10th of November, from the news section. Vicious thug tried to chop off man's fingers during a horrific attack. Article by Dave Findlay. A vicious thug who tried to chop off a man's fingers during a horrific attack and threatened to cut out his tongue could face a life sentence. A judge on Friday ordered a full risk assessment to be carried out on Paul Berry, which can lead to the imposition of an order for lifelong restriction. Lord Fully said he was satisfied that the risk criteria were met for making a risk assessment order, although that would not tie his hands when it came to sentencing the knife attacker. The 35-year-old earlier admitted detaining and assaulting George Lindsay to his severe injury, permanent disfigurement and impairment at a flat in Rutherland in South Lanarkshire on September 1st last year. During the ordeal, Berry punched and kicked the victim, struck him with knives, burnt him with cigarettes and pinned his hand to the floor as he tried to save her fingers. Lord Fairley told him, You have pled guilty to an extremely serious assault upon Mr Lindsay that comes in the back of a record which can only be regarded as appalling. The court heard that Berry was at a flat in Sky Road with his older brother Richard, 40, when the victim was invited in. But after spending time together, a row broke out, which turned broke out, which turned violent. Both brothers started punching and kicking the victim. Advocate De- Deputy Louis Beatty said the younger brother stripped the victim of his clothes, and he was forced onto the floor, and his legs and feet were tied with yellow rope. She said the assault was continued by Paul Berry for what George Lindsay estimated to be an hour. Paul Berry told him he could not leave and gave no explanation for the prolonged assault. Lit cigarettes were used to burn the victim in the face and body, and he was repeatedly struck in the body and limbs with a knife. The prosecutor said, Paul Berry then used the knife to attempt to sever Mr Lindsay's pinky and middle finger of his left hand. The injured man was eventually put in the shower and told to get washed. He was told not to tell anyone of the incident. Paul Berry threatened to cut his tongue out to prevent him giving a statement, said the advocate deputy. But police were alerted and arrived to find the brothers and victims still in the property, with blood-stained clothes and shoes in a washing machine. Mr Lindsay had 48 stitches and 23 staples inserted to injuries sustained in their deal. The older brother earlier admitted a restricted assault charge of kicking and punching the victim, which did not involve the use of weapons on the victim and was jailed for 30 months today. The court heard that he expressed extreme regret for the attack and wished to apologise to the victim. Sentence was adjourned on Paul Berry until February next year at the High Court in Glasgow. And that report was by Dave Finlay. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 10th of November, from the news section, Exclusive Work on £3.2 million Glasgow Nursery and Community Hub starts soon. This exclusive article is by Esther Tarnay. Glasgow's Lord Provost today confirmed that a huge development in Milton will start in January. Yesterday, the Glasgow Times reported that a new nursery and community centre 
will be opened in a former school site at Chapinsay Street after council planners approved the project. Scaraway Nursery School and Charity North United Communities are set to move into a hub on land previously used by Glasgow School for the Deaf. Jacqueline McLaren, Glasgow's first citizen, visited the area today to celebrate the green light on the plans and she confirmed work will start in January. She said, It's fantastic to have been given the go-ahead for this vital resource. It's something that's badly needed and I'm so proud and excited that work is finally starting. It's going to make a huge difference to the people living here. It's going to be a flagship resource bringing together partners from the Council's Education Service, the Third Sector and Glasgow Caledonian University for the very first time. It's something we can all be hugely proud of and I'm confident it will become the template for future similar community assets. Jill Mackay, CEO of North United Communities, said, I'm just so excited and thrilled for everyone in the community. They convinced the Scottish Government there was this need to be met. They convinced the decision makers in their community it was worth investing in. This new facility is really the culmination of their hard work spanning more than five years. The floor in our old hut collapsed and that was really the catalyst to bid for for a new centre. I can't quite believe it's finally happening. It's particularly important for our young people to have a safe space and place. This is for them, and they deserve it. And the article was an exclusive by Esther Tarnay. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. Concern over how UK climate change policy will affect Glasgow an article written by Catherine Hunter. Glasgow has reaffirmed its commitment to meet its 2030 net zero target after the UK government pushed back the ban on new petrol and diesel cars by five years. The City Council says it's making good progress to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2030 by cutting greenhouse gases, with any remaining emissions absorbed from the atmosphere by oceans and forests. A report presented to councillors highlighted that the council continues to make good progress in its mission and remains ahead of target despite an increase in emissions as a result of the recovery from the pandemic. But concerns were raised about how changes made to tackling climate change by the UK government would impact Glasgow City Council. This includes moving back the ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by five years so all sales of new cars from 2035 will be zero emission, and delaying the ban on installing oil and LPG boilers and new coal heating for off-gas grid homes to 2035, instead of phasing them out from 2026. Labour councillor Kieran O'Neill said, We have got a situation at the moment where the UK government seems to be changing its mind on quite a lot of fundamental issues, that we probably took for granted when it comes to tackling the climate emergency. What impact is that going to have in terms of our plan for the city? A council officer confirmed that these announcements would be unlikely to change the local authority's course of direction, and they're still committed to reaching its 2030 target. Councillor Angus Miller, convener for climate, said... Our commitment as a city and our aspirations are absolutely steadfast in terms of the urgency with which we're seeking to tackle the climate emergency. The Scottish Government is taking longer to review the climate plan at national level in response to the changes that have been announced at Westminster. I don't think that means that the Scottish Government's ambition is likely to change in terms of its commitment to tackle climate change. Its ability to respond to the climate emergency will be constrained or influenced by what's happening in Westminster. As a council, we should be calling on the national government to continue to prioritise climate change and the journey to net zero and replace the programmes of funding that will enable us as a city to accelerate that transition. An article written by Catherine Hunter. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. Council calls for an upgrade to the broken bus system across Lanarkshire. An article written by Shannon Milmean. South Lanarkshire Council is calling for an upgrade to the bus system across Lanarkshire after claims that it has been broken for years. At a recent full council meeting, Councillor Joe Fagan, 
who represents East Kilbride Central and North, proposed plans to roll out a London-style bus system across Lanarkshire and the west of Scotland. The plan includes the council working together with councils across Strathclyde to take control of the region's bus networks. This has already been done by councils south of the border in Manchester and in Liverpool. Councillor Fagan said that the current bus system is flawed and urged councillors to back his proposal to introduce a seamless new network. He said, The bus market in the west of Scotland is broken. It's been that way for years. It's time to scrap the broken bus market and replace it with a system that is democratically controlled and accountable. Buses should be run for people, not for profit. With metropolitan regions like Greater Manchester and Merseyside embracing London-style bus franchising with seamless integrated ticketing, it's time Scotland's city regions did the same. We are calling on Strathclyde Passenger Transport to use new Transport Act powers to take back control of the bus network and ensure that routes and pricing deliver a better deal for passengers. Integrated, affordable public transport is the norm in other parts of Europe. It should be the norm here as well. The taxpayer invests a huge amount in a broken system. By regulating the network under a new franchise, I'm confident we can get value for money for taxpayers and fair-paying passengers and that we can build a modern public transport system that joins our communities up better. The Council will now write to Strathclyde Passenger Transport and the Scottish Government to communicate its view that a new model of bus provision for Strathclyde must be developed, that is integrated and democratically accountable. The new model of bus provision must contribute towards regional transport strategy objectives and policies set out by Strathclyde Passenger Transport. And the Council will call on the Scottish Government to support local authorities and transport authorities seeking to replace deregulated bus models with models of regulation or common ownership with fair funding regulation that represents the wishes of Scotland's communities and regions. Councillor Ross Gowland of Clydesdale South said, As a regular bus user myself, I know how stretched local bus services can be. In rural areas, there are serious bus black spots where residents are poorly served by bus services and some of these villages are the most deprived in South Lanarkshire. There is a compelling case for creating an integrated and democratically accountable bus franchise right across the Strathclyde region. An article written by Shannon Milmean. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. Lord Provost joins armed forces to mark Remembrance Sunday. An article written by Taylor Murray. Glasgow's Lord Provost joined several members of the armed forces at George Square to mark Remembrance Sunday. On a brisk morning yesterday, a crowd formed in the city centre square when Jacqueline McLaren, Deputy First Minister Shona Robeson and members of the armed forces laid wreaths of poppies at the cenotaph to remember the fallen. Ms McLaren said it was a proud moment for her to be able to lay a wreath at the service. The Lord Provost said... Solemn day and so very proud to lay a wreath in my capacity as Lord Lieutenant on behalf of the city. A great turnout from Glasgow in the sunshine. Thanks to everyone. The leader of Glasgow City Council, Susan Aitken, was also in attendance for the Remembrance Sunday event. A two-minute silence had taken place at the Cenotaph, just outside the city chambers, with some veterans and children invited to lay a wreath too. Commemorations also took place across the country, including in Edinburgh, where the First Minister, Hamza Youssef, paid his respects. The First Minister said it was an honour to lay a wreath on behalf of the Scottish Government. Meanwhile, on Armistice Day, a service was held in Glasgow Central Station for its annual tribute. Veterans and invited guests were joined by onlookers and commuters at a two-minute silence at 11am. The station, which has a war memorial, was the departure point for many men and women who went off to war. An article written by Taylor Murray. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. ScotRail teams up with University to offer training. An article written by Taylor Murray. 
A group of Glasgow University students looking to assist visually impaired people have teamed up with Scott Rail. As part of their commitment to making the railway accessible for all, Scott Rail helped the next generation of support workers to get hands-on experience. Students from the university's graduate diploma in low vision rehabilitation took part in a practical training session at Mulgai Station. Using a train at the station, the training allowed future vision rehabilitation specialists to practice teaching visually impaired people how to access the railway safely. Students were provided with knowledge and experience in teaching a client the route to the railway station using a long cane. They were also taught to have the skills to familiarise the person with the main features of the station and the train itself. Patrick Niamurundira, Scottrail Access and Inclusion Manager, said, "Scottrail is committed to making the railway accessible for all, and we will do everything we can to ensure as many people as possible can access our services." Facilitating training sessions like this play a key role in helping to build confidence and allowing visually impaired people to travel independently and safely on Scotland's railway. Simon Labbett, guest lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University, said, "Giving blind and partially sighted people the confidence to use public transport is absolutely essential." Thanks to Scotrail's generous initiative, Scotland's next generation of vision rehab specialists will feel more confident in promoting access to train travel with their clients. An article written by Taylor Murray, Glasgow Times News, on Monday, the thirteenth of November. Glasgow's ugliest building to be transformed into a tech hub. An article written by Drew Sandilands. A landmark Glasgow building is set to be transformed after a £60 million plan to create a tech and digital hub was approved. Bruntwood SciTech has been granted permission to revamp the Met Tower, which has been wrapped in People Make Glasgow branding since the 2014 Commonwealth Games by Glasgow City Council. The B-listed former Glasgow College of Building and Printing has been empty for a decade and was bought by Bruntwood, a property firm working in the science and technology sectors, for £16.2 million last year. New images show how the tech hub will look after the redevelopment, which is expected to be completed in time to open the building in winter 2025. It's hoped tech and digital university spin-outs, start-up and scale-ups will be located alongside global tech businesses, creating an innovative, collaborative tech cluster. Bruntwood will also build a 10-storey tower, which will connect to the Met Tower via a new Wellbeing Plaza space. Between the two towers, there will be more than 200,000 square feet of office space. Enabling works have already begun, and construction is expected to start in spring next year. The Met Tower plan includes a 60-person rooftop flexible event space, a breakout lounge for all startups, scale-ups, and large businesses, and a 16-person boardroom. Darren Williams, building consultancy director at Bruntwood SciTech, said, "Glasgow is already on its way to becoming a world-leading tech hub and one of the UK's fastest-growing clusters." And with approval of our plans now confirmed, we're very much looking forward to the Met Tower becoming the beacon for the tech community in the city. He added that the tower couldn't be better placed, surrounded by two brilliant universities, an exceptional college, and several established alternative training providers, who will ensure that the businesses who locate to the Met Tower can tap into a strong, highly skilled talent pool. The developers have said that the Met Tower's recognisable upside-down boat structure will be retained and transformed into a 60-person lounge and event space with floor-to-ceiling windows. There'll also be a wellness and treatment room, a cafe, and a multi-faith space. In the new tower, there are plans for offices, a breakout, a retail unit, and a roof terrace. It will also have access to the Met Tower's facilities. Council leader Susan Aitken said that the Met Tower project is a huge vote of confidence in Glasgow's growing reputation as an international centre of innovation, creativity, and opportunity. 
It also recognises our vision for a changing city centre, one with new industries and new purposes, and where innovation and technology are brought into the heart of city life. She added, The Met Tower has been a Glasgow icon for 60 years, and Bruntwood Cytec's investment in this landmark will ensure it remains a symbol of the city for generations to come. An article written by Drew Sandilands. Glasgow Times News on Monday, the 13th of November. Health Board is treated as a suspect over the death of a girl. An article written by Hannah Roger. Scotland's biggest health board is reportedly being considered a suspect in the death of a 10-year-old girl. Millie Main died in 2017 after she contracted an infection at the Royal Hospital for Children's Cancer Ward on the campus of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. Police Scotland were subsequently instructed to investigate the death of Millie and a number of others. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde confirmed on Sunday that there had been an update to the status of the inquiry, but emphasised that no final decision has been made on its outcome. A report from the Sunday Mail claimed the Health Board is being considered a formal suspect. A statement from the Health Board said, Our sympathies remain with the families who have been affected by events at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and Royal Hospital for Children. We have received a communication from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service about this update to the status of their ongoing inquiry. It should be made clear that this letter does not indicate that the Fiscal Service has formed a final view. It has thanked us for our voluntary contribution so far and we will continue to cooperate with this investigation. Scottish Labour leader Anna Sawa has campaigned for the families of those impacted by issues at the hospital, which, along with problems at the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People in Edinburgh, prompted the Scottish Government to launch a public inquiry. Millie's mother, Kimberly Darach, accused the Health Board of murder during hearing of the inquiry. She and Mr Sawa have been instrumental in bringing public attention to the issue. Mr Sawa said, It has taken four years for us to get this far, and what Kimberley has been told by the police could mean we are now one step closer to getting justice for Millie. I hope the full force of the law is used so that no family ever again has to go through what Millie's family have been through. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service asked Police Scotland to investigate a number of deaths at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital campus in Glasgow. Our investigation is ongoing and it would be inappropriate to comment further. An article written by Hannah Roger. Glasgow Times on Monday the 13th of November. Opinion. Challenge to 50% social care charges increase. A column written by Mike Daly. In April, Glasgow City Council changed its social care charging policy, increasing the charges levied on disabled and non-disabled persons requiring non-residential social care services, such as home care. Last week, a petition for judicial review was lodged at Scotland's highest civil court, the Court of Session, challenging the lawfulness of the charging policy in relation to certain disabled service users under the 2010 Equality Act and Scots Common Law. An initial 10.1% increase in weekly charges was implemented on April 6th this year, when the UK government uprated various welfare benefits by the rate of inflation. However, from April the 24th, the charges for disabled persons who were single, under 60 years of age and requiring three and a half hours or more of social care per week were increased by a further 50%. For this particular group of people with disabilities in Glasgow, this represented a 65% increase in relation to charges before April the 10th this year. Most people affected rely exclusively on social security benefits as their only source of income. Many other service users of home care have had no or much lower increases on a pro-rata basis. 
why has one particular group of disabled persons ended up being charged disproportionately higher costs than anyone else in the city? The answer may lie in a combination of factors, a lack of proper consultation with service users and a failure to appreciate that charging policy increases were not sophisticated enough to apply on an equal pro rata basis. For example, if you're in the group of being single and under 60 years of age, you receive a much lower minimum income threshold than for couples or single persons over 60 years of age. If you only need three or fewer hours of care each week, you won't notice any or much change in costs. However, if you're single, under 60 and have disabilities that require a more intensive level of home care support, you're exposed to the full 65% hike in weekly charges. How can that be equitable when your income has only increased by 10%? How can that be equal treatment when you need to pay proportionately more than many other service users in different groups with lower needs? Glasgow City Council decided that it didn't have to carry out a full equality impact assessment of its charging policy changes in March this year. That was an extraordinary decision for two main reasons. First, proposing to hike care costs for some disabled people by 50% above inflation required careful thought as to its impact on health and well-being. Second, the equality screening document produced in March this year confirmed that charging policy changes were based on a consultation with a tiny number of people. Over a three-week period in January and February, the Council invited 5,600 service users to participate in a survey, but only 118 responses were received, a 2% response rate. Interestingly, the chosen sample group appears to be missing many service users. Public Health Scotland's social care statistics for 2020-2021 confirm that 8,665 people in the client group of elderly and frail received home care services in Glasgow, with 2,605 people in the physical or sensory disability client group and 2,355 people classed as other. People can be in more than one group. There is, of course, nothing to prevent Glasgow City Council now undertaking a proper equality impact assessment on its charging policy and addressing the apparent injustice in its policy. A column written by Mike Daly. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. Hamza Youssef told that the pay rise for social care staff is not enough. An article written by Morgan Carmichael. More than a 100 organisations have signed a joint letter to the First Minister saying the upcoming pay increase for social care and support staff is not enough. The letter, organised by the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland, says the increase to £12 an hour, in line with the real living wage, tells staff they are only worth the bare minimum. It was signed by 110 organisations, including social care providers, charities and carers' representatives. The letter was sent to Hamza Youssef on Friday morning. It said... With the Scottish Government setting the new base rate of pay for social care staff at £12 an hour from next spring, simply matching the updated real living wage and no more, the message to this staff is clear. You are only worth the bare minimum. This despite the fundamental work they do supporting people to thrive and live independent lives, work that is at the heart of your vision for equality, opportunity and community in Scotland. £12 per hour is not enough. Rachel Cackett, Chief Executive of the Coalition, said Organisations that provide social care are rapidly losing staff because the current pay of £10.90 is simply too low to retain them and they migrate to better paid jobs elsewhere. It's a scandal that in communities across Scotland, people who need support to live, thrive and stay independent can't get it because there isn't the staff available. As the First Minister will see from the range of signatories to this letter, the first time so many organisations have come together to make a joint call on this issue 
we represent an emerging movement who is determined to bring social justice to social care and support. In response to the letter, Social Care Minister Marie Todd said, Funding for social care has increased by over £800 million compared to 2021-2022 as part of a record high health and social care budget of more than £19 billion and we continue to work with partners to address the pressures they face and take forward reform to deliver improved sustainable services. Social care workers delivering direct care in commission services will see their pay increase to a minimum of £12 per hour from April 2024, up from the £10.90 minimum rate introduced this year. The creation of the National Care Service will help to provide consistency in further improved pay and conditions, access to training and development, and ensuring a career in social care is attractive and rewarding – but we are beginning to make those improvements now. An article written by Morgan Carmichael. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 13th of November. Thousands gather in Glasgow city centre to hold a demonstration. An article written by Nicole Mitchell. Thousands of people gathered in Glasgow city centre on Saturday to take part in a demonstration calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Activists gathered at the Buchanan Street steps from 1pm for one of a number of demonstrations across Scotland. The events were organised by the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign, a group consisting of religious organisations and activists, including Scottish Friends of Palestine and the Muslim Community of Scotland. Ahead of the rally, the campaign's chairman, Jerry Coots, said, The focus of our rally will be on people killed in wars, including both world wars, with a renewed call to end all wars. We will also call for an end to war crimes, including those currently being committed in occupied Palestine. The conflict did not start on October the 7th. The besieged people of Palestine have endured over seven decades of illegal occupation, violence and loss of land and rights. We are calling for an immediate ceasefire. The demonstrations come against the backdrop of heightened political tensions, with a pro-Palestinian march in London on Armistice Day being branded provocative and disrespectful by the Prime Minister. An article written by Nicole Mitchell. Glasgow Times News. On Monday the 13th of November. Town Centre revamp plan to go ahead. An article written by Shannon Milmean. A strategy to improve Rutherglen Town Centre has been given the go-ahead. At the Community and Enterprise Resource Committee on Tuesday, councillors approved plans for a town centre strategy and action plan. The strategy follows four previous plans for Hamilton, Blantyre, Cambus Lang and Lark Hall. Within the action plan, there are a range of initiatives which the Council will pursue with partners to support the vitality and viability of the Town Centre. Chair of the Community and Enterprise Resource Committee and Rutherglen South Councillor Robert Brown praised the plans. He said, Can I welcome the report and confirm the point about the setting up of a cross-party and community group Rutherglen 900, to take this forward with the point of view of the local community. I think there should be a focus on the community as well. Councillor Andrea Cowan, representing Rutherglen Central and North, echoed this and said, I'd like to welcome this. It's obviously very welcome in the area. The Cambus Lang plan has improved Cambus Lang Main Street and there have been big improvements. And Rutherglen, I think, starts in a very good position, and I look forward to being involved in the Rutherglen 900 activities and getting stuck into the steering group activities. The strategy recognises a series of objectives for Rutherglen, which are consistent with the activity being promoted by Scotland's Towns Partnerships and others. It will be a collaborative approach across all sectors and is the only way to bring meaningful and sustainable regeneration for the town. 
the 900th anniversary of the Charter of the Royal Borough of Rutherglen, which is the oldest royal borough in Scotland, will be marked in 2026, and the town centre will be a key focus of celebrations to mark this occasion. A steering group has recently been established to work on this initiative, and the action plan will support and complement the growing programme of community-led events leading up to the celebrations. And the strategy presents a town centre action plan which captures the priorities for Rutherglen and illustrates where resources and activities should be focused. Plans to do more to promote cultural assets within the town centre are also being explored, with the potential to enhance them over the coming years. It's intended that the consultative draft will be published and made available for consultation both online and in person during February and March next year. Following consideration of the feedback received, a finalised strategy will be prepared and presented to the Community and Enterprise Resources Committee in June next year. An article written by Shannon Milmean. Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 14th of November. From the news section, a column by Annie Wells. We can't let our city become dangerous again. The time and effort invested in helping Glasgow shed its reputation as one of Europe's most dangerous cities was considerable. It not only made for a safer place, protecting lives and improving communities in the process, but became the envy of the world, and in many respects. Officials from London and even the US have visited to see for themselves what exactly changed in order to persuade gang members to put down their knives and countless others to stay out of trouble. But the most recent warnings on policing numbers cannot be ignored. And if the decline in frontline officers patrolling Glasgow's streets continues to fall, the Scottish Government may not be patting itself on the back for much longer. The Scottish Police Federation recently warned that on a nationwide basis, lives could be lost if the head count of our officers continue to fall. The police force itself has repeatedly told ministers that if funding isn't increased, it simply won't be able to do its job. And despite the well-documented improvements over the longer term, Glasgow continues to be Scotland's knife crime capital by some distance. In 2022-23, there were 160 recorded assaults with a sharp object. Given Glasgow's size, it's unsurprising that the numbers were higher than anywhere else. But the rate per head, a fairer measure, allowing for population differences, shows 13.5 in every 100,000 people in the city were assaulted with a knife last year. That's almost double the national average, which shows that while things have got better, you're still twice as likely to be stabbed in Glasgow as anywhere else in Scotland. We need and trust the police on the street to help reduce this risk and ensure perpetrators are caught and brought to justice. Their presence acts as a deterrent to those considering violent crime and gives another layer of protection to ordinary people. But in the last three years, we've also seen a reduction in bobbies on the beat, according to Police Scotland's own latest data. In March 2020, there were 2,553 local officers assigned specifically to Glasgow's G Division. By June this year, that had fallen to 2,489, a drop of 2.5%. Police can also choose from a wider regional pool, the West Region, to make up the numbers if they are short. Even those figures fell from 1,535 down to 1,334. If desperate, the local force can call on national assistance for incidents requiring major investigation or an armed response. However, when it comes to officers on the ground, working with their communities and getting to know the victims of crime and the criminals themselves, things are on the slide. That means individual police officers who work so hard 
just don't have the time to be proactive. They don't have the capacity to go into schools or to work in community centres in areas where violence is more prevalent. The cops are overstretched, overworked and, instead of putting quality time into helping reduce crime in the longer term, are now restricted to the hamster wheel of responding to 999 calls. Things need to change. The whole city should be proud of the decades-long effort that's gone into boosting Glasgow's name across the world. It would be deeply regrettable if a few years of government negligence and underfunding puts things into reverse. This was an article by Annie Wells, We Can't Let Our City Become Dangerous Again. This article is from the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 14th of November. It's from the news section and the author is Joshua Searle. The cost of living payment eligibility should be widened, MPs say. Cost of living payments are insufficient and should be paid to more people, MPs are warning. The Cross-Party Work and Pensions Committee called for the government to consider widening the eligibility criteria for future payments. Its report said, We are particularly concerned that the additional support offered to those with disabilities was only £150 per year, and we recommend that this particular support be increased in proportion to the costs that people with disabilities incur. The recommendations follow an inquiry examining the package of support introduced to protect people claiming benefits from the effects of rising energy prices and inflation. After receiving nearly 2,000 survey responses from those with first-hand experience of cost of living payments, the committee said it acknowledges the important impact the payments have made and the speed of distribution but it said that the unsophisticated nature of the payment system has placed significant limitations on how it has met the needs of different groups, such as families, older people and those with disabilities. Any future cost-of-living support payments should take account of family size, while financial support for those with disabilities should be increased in proportion to the additional costs that they incur the report argued. It also suggested that the government consider uprating universal credit instead of issuing payments. The report said, given we have also heard that an uplift of the regular benefits received would be more beneficial for budgeting than ad hoc cost of living support payments, the government should consider uprating universal credit instead of issuing these payments. It should maintain the ad hoc payment system for those on legacy benefits as these benefits cannot easily be uprated. Sir Stephen Timms, Chair of the Work and Pensions Committee, said, While the support payments have made an important impact in helping those most in need during these difficult times, the overall package has offered just short-term retreat reprieve for many while others have slipped through the safety net altogether. Families with children need support over and above the flat rate on offer, while the extra £150 a year paid to those with disabilities who incur unavoidable extra expenses barely touches the sides. There are also low-income households receiving only housing benefit, currently deemed ineligible for extra help. While some eligible people, with no recourse to public funds, are being denied access to the Household Support Fund because of unclear guidance to councils. It is vital that the government listens to those with everyday experience of support payments, so it learns important lessons should a new package of support be required in the future. Ministers should get ahead of the game by bringing forward their evaluation of the measures and, at the same time, give serious thought to changes to the wider benefit system that would make ad hoc payments less necessary. A Department for Work and Pension spokesperson said, The cost of living payments have provided a significant financial boost 
to millions of households. Just one part of the record 94 billion support package we have provided to help with the rising cost of bills. This includes a 10.1% increase to the benefits earlier this year, and we're investing 3.5 billion to help thousands into jobs the best way to secure their financial security in the long term. Ultimately, the best way we can help families is to reduce inflation and we're sticking to our plan to half it this year, taking the long-term decisions that will secure the country's financial future. Louise Rubin, Head of Policy at Disability Equality Charity Scope, said, We back the committee's call that there needs to be more cost of living support for disabled people this winter. We are hearing from disabled people who can't afford to power vital equipment, face excruciating bills and don't know which way to turn. This was an article called The Cost of Living Payment Eligibility Should Be Widened, MP said by Joshua Searle. Glasgow Times, Tuesday 14th of November Man rushed to Glasgow Hospital after being rescued from the River Clyde by Nicole Mitchell. A man has been rushed to hospital after being pulled from the River Clyde. Emergency services were called at the Kingston Bridge at around 8.40am this morning following a report of concern for a person. The man was rescued from the water. He has been taken to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital by ambulance. His condition is not known. We previously reported police, fire and ambulance were all spotted at the Bruma Law by the River Clyde. Lanes 1 and 2 of the M8 Kingston Bridge remain partially closed as police carry out inquiries to establish the full circumstances surrounding the incident. A Police Scotland spokesperson said... Around 8.40am on Tuesday, November the 14th, 2023, police received a report of concern for person on the Kingston Bridge in Glasgow. Emergency services attended and a man has been rescued from the water. He has been taken by ambulance to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. The Kingston Bridge remains partially closed and inquiries are ongoing to establish the full circumstances of the incident. A Scottish Ambulance Service spokesperson said, We received a call at 8.45am today to attend an incident at Kingston Bridge in Glasgow. We dispatched two ambulances, our special operations team, a critical care paramedic and our trauma team to the scene. We transported one male patient to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. A spokesperson A spokesperson for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service said, We supported emergency service partners at an incident on the Kingston Bridge in Glasgow. Operations Control mobilised two appliances and other specialist resources to the area after the alarm was raised at 8.41am on Tuesday, November 14th. Firefighters rescued a male from the water and he was passed into the care of the Scottish Ambulance Service. Crews left the scene at 10.08am. an article, Man Rushed to Glasgow Hospital After Being Rescued from the River Clyde by Nicole Mitchell. This is from the Glasgow Times on Tuesday the 14th of November 2023 from the Lifestyle section. Hamilton Football Club Stadium to host magical Christmas event. This article is written by Morgan Carmichael. A popular football stadium will be hosting a magical event this festive season. Hamilton Stadium, home to Hamilton Academical Football Club, Hamilton Ackes, will become a festive hub of joy, laughter and the best of holiday traditions from December the 12th until January the 7th, 2024 as the ground will be transformed into a winter village. The Hamilton Stadium Winter Village will host a range of food stalls, as well as a Christmas market, featuring items from local artisans and suppliers, and a festive cinema. Attendees will also be able to attend Santa's Grotto, and go ice skating at an added cost. 
Santa's Grotto will be open seven days a week from 10am to 6pm up until December the 24th and ice skating will be open for the duration of the Winter Village except for Christmas Day. Entry into the event is free and no pre-booking is required. That article was written by Morgan Carmichael. This is from the Glasgow Times on Tuesday the 14th of November 2023. From the Lifestyle section. New Aldi Supermarket to open in Coatbridge near Glasgow. This article is written by Morgan Carmichael. Aldi is set to open a brand new store near Glasgow this month. The new shop on Tennant Street, Coatbridge, will replace the existing store on Weavers Road and will open on Thursday, November 30th at 8am. Run by store manager Jamie McVicker, along with a team of 40 colleagues, the new store will offer customers high-quality, low-priced products, as well as fresh Scottish meat products, weekly offers, exclusive beers, wines and spirits, and a food-to-go section at the front of the store. Elders' special buys will also be available in the middle aisle every Thursday and Sunday, offering a wide range of products, from electrical items to garden tools. Aldi's store manager, Jamie McVicker, said, We can't wait to open the doors to the new store in Coatbridge. It's set to be a special day. To celebrate the official partnership between Aldi and Paralympics GB, GB Paralympian silver and bronze medalist Scott Quinn will join the team to cut the all-important ribbon on opening morning. Scott will also give away complimentary bags of fresh fruit and vegetables from Aldi's famous Super 6 range to the first customers in the queue. Scott said, I'm so excited to be opening Aldi's new store. It'll be great to chat to customers and a lovely way for me to thank Aldi for its support of Paralympics GB. The new store will open from Monday to Saturday between 8am until 10pm and Sunday from 9am until 8pm. That article was written by Morgan Carmichael. This is from the Glasgow Times, on Tuesday the 14th of November 2023, from the Lifestyle section. Paisley Cafe named as Best Coffee Shop in Scotland. This article is written by Jacob Nicholl. A popular Renfrewshire cafe has caused a stir by winning a national honour for a second year in a row. Spoon's Coffee House in Causeyside Street, Paisley, has been named Best Coffee Shop at the annual Scotland's Business Awards. We previously reported how the cafe was voted the highest scoring coffee shop in Renfrewshire in May and won the same title for Scotland at last year's finals. James Carmichael, owner of Spoon's Coffee House, said the team were really shocked about their latest achievement. He told the Glasgow Times, We were surprised, as there were quite a few good contenders in this year's category. For us to win the award in the grand final two years in a row made it a really good night. I think we get great support from the local community because we provide good, honest food and great coffee. Scotland's Business Awards sees members of the public vote for the finalists before they are visited by mystery shoppers. James said, When the regulars come in, I've been getting them to hold the award and take a picture with it underneath the spoons sign, and we're going to make a collage of all the pictures. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be where we are, as they are the people who vote for us and support us every day. I would like to thank the people of Paisley, as well as the staff and my wife, who works for us as well. Recently, the cafe has been engaging with the local community, such as inviting local nursery kids to make their own miniature pizzas. James added, We've had more kids now coming over with their parents to get pictures in spoons, so I think it's important to keep doing stuff like this in the community, as it helps us and it helps give communities somewhere to go. This latest award has pumped the staff up a little bit as well, especially as it has been non-stop here recently. 
all of the staff were able to come along to the awards ceremony this time, which made it a bit more exciting for them as well. That article was written by Jacob Nicholl. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 15th of November 2023 from the news section and the headline reads Drug cops bust Glasgow man with over £1,000 of heroin. This article was by Esther Tarnay. A Glasgow man was caught by police during a heroin deal. Robert Comrie, 52, was spotted by officers around 7pm on January 5th, 2023. Cops were on plain clothes patrol in an unmarked vehicle and saw him walking on a footpath at Brandon Street in Deniston with two other men. They appeared to be involved in a transaction. Police left their vehicle and approached them, identifying themselves. The trio was informed they would be searched. At this stage, Comrie said to the officer he had diamorphine, also known as heroin, in his pocket. Cops then found 57 wraps containing brown powder. They arrested Comrie of Deniston and took him to the police station. The powder in the wraps was tested and came back positive for heroin. It was also valued at £1,140. Comrie appeared at a hearing in Glasgow Sheriff Court last week in front of Sheriff Bernard Ablett after he pleaded guilty to supplying the drug. Comrie's lawyer said he has been using drugs, he has difficulties with his mental health, He's not fit for unpaid work. The hostel where he stays has confirmed that tank would be suitable. Sheriff Ablett said, It has often been said that those who are concerned in the supply of Class A drugs should be sent to prison. However, in this case, I am prepared to impose a restriction of liberty order on you, as well as supervision. Comrie was tagged in order to stay within his home between 7pm and 7am every day for 120 days. He was also sentenced to unpaid work and supervision for 15 months. This article was by Esther Tarnay. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 15th of November 2023 from the news section. And the headline reads, Hundreds of drivers find multiple times in Glasgow LEZ. This article was by Stuart Patterson. Hundreds of drivers have been fined multiple times for entering Glasgow's low emission zone. The penalty for driving into the zone, which is the city centre, starts at £60, then doubles for repeat breaches up to a maximum of £480 for cars and light goods vehicles, and £960 for minibuses, buses, coaches and HGVs. Figures show more than 20,000 fines have been issued since June 1st, when enforcement of Phase 2 of the zone began. A breakdown of the figures shows that 1,863 people have had a second fine of £120 issued. A third offence, with a fine of £240 applied, was issued 482 times and a fourth of £480 was dished out on 164 occasions. A fifth fine of £960 issued to HGVs and coaches was applied to 111 drivers. Enforcement of the LEZ began in June, but repeat fines only started to be issued from July onwards. A legal challenge to the LEZ at the Court of Session failed last month when a motor trade repair firm, Patents, argued that the LEZ was unlawful and unnecessary because air quality targets had already been met. The court ruled it was lawful and the council was entitled to introduce the zone to help meet air quality standards. A spokesperson for Glasgow City Council said... Scottish LEZs operate by way of a penalty system, set in legislation to discourage non-compliant vehicle entry and to maximise the air quality benefits that can be delivered. Surcharging, whereby the penalty charge rate doubles for subsequent LEZ breaches, commenced in July after an initial familiarisation period and applies after the first or most recent penalty charge notice can be expected to have been received by the vehicle's registered keeper. Penalties are reduced by 50% if paid within 14 days, with all revenue above that incurred in running Glasgow's LAZ scheme itself. Only used for activities that help reduce air pollution or contribute towards achieving our climate change targets. This article was by Stuart Past. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 15th of November 2023 from the news section. And the headline reads, Pete Doherty talks death 
Kate Moss and Heroin with Thuru. This article is by Matthew Evans. Pete Doherty bared all in a hugely compelling interview with Louis Theroux that will go down as one of the documentarian's most memorable. The Libertine singer invited Theroux to his Normandy home where they discussed the bizarre, the candid and the deeply complicated. Throughout the interview, you could tell there was something amiss with Pete who came across as a troubled, tortured soul. After performing an acoustic version of Can't Stand Me Now, Louis asked if it had been recorded around 2004. Pete tearfully replied yes. He discussed Kate Moss and how her asking for coke, the drink, from her assistant put him off her. Then how his current partner got him semi-sober for the sake of their child and how his old Margate crew are mostly dead because of heroin use. Then came the tender topic of Mark Blanco. He admitted that he ran away on the fatal night when Blanco lost his life in 2006. The rock star admitted he regretted running away, yet he fled the scene for fear of being arrested due to his possession of Class A drugs. He told Lou, you can't blame her, Blanco's mother, for that. Her son fell to his death, and some people, I think, genuinely believe he was thrown to his death, and then I'm on camera running away. I've never met Sheila Blanco, but I can understand her anger. I think her anger at me, well, it is misplaced. Marco sadly died in hospital from head injuries a day after he was found under the balcony of Doherty's literary agent and friend, Paul Rountill. No one knows what happened because no one saw it. I certainly didn't see it, added Pete. I should probably have stood my ground, taken a deep breath and had the effing balls to stay there, flush everything down the toilet and be there when the police came. But I didn't want to see the police. It was an effing inconvenience to me and that's an awful thing to say. He's lying, dying in the street, and I was concerned about getting nicked for possession. Pete admits he no longer touches the hard stuff, but could still be seen enjoying alcohol, here and there in front of Louis. After an emotional moment between bandmate Carl Barrett, another real tearjerker, Louis is invited into Pete's family home. Pete at one point gets up in mid-conversation with Theroux and takes a swig from a bottle. He then immediately clutches his chest and stumbles around causing the filmmaker to try and help him, visibly concerned. It was from here the conversation turned even more morbid. How's your health in general? Theroux asked, once Doherty had settled back down on the sofa. You're looking at a very sick man, Doherty replied. I've battered it, haven't I? I've effing caned it. The heroin and the crack, I surrendered to that, and then it was cocaine and the smoking and the alcohol. Now it's cheese and the sausage on and the sugar and the tea. It's all got to go. You told me a little while ago, if you don't change your diet, then you're going to have diabetes and cholesterol problems, he continued. Death's lurking, you know what I mean. That's why I carry that stick. Doherty seemed doubtful that he would live to see his daughter, Billy May, grow up, telling through he would love to hear her say her first words. Maybe watch her grow up and start a family of her own. That's 25 years, Theroux suggested. That's a stretch though, isn't it? A doubtful looking doctor there responded. This article was by Matthew Evans. This is from the Glasgow Times on the 15th of November 2023 from the news section and the headline reads Police lock down Cambus Lang restaurant as cannabis found within. This article is by Esther Tarnay. Officers locked down a Cambus Lang restaurant after a large cannabis cultivation was found within. Cops taped off Fratelli's on Glasgow Road following the discovery. In a picture sent to the Glasgow Times, officers can be seen guarding blue tape. It is understood that the eatery has been closed for some time prior to this. Police Scotland has confirmed that two men, aged 21 and 29, have been arrested and the investigation is ongoing. A force spokesperson said around 9.50am on Tuesday, November 14th, 2023, Officers executed a search warrant at a business premises in Glasgow Road, Canvas Lang. A large cannabis cultivation was discovered within the building. Two men, aged 21 and 29, have been arrested in connection with the incident and inquiries are continuing. This article was by Esther Tarnay. That concludes this week's edition of the Glasgow Times podcast. 
please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.